Hello. Okay. Yes, we're good to go. So we're really going to jump in quite quick into who we are and then into the content because normally we have like 40 minutes, 45 minutes to do this. We cut it down drastically, but we're quite sure we'll still not make it. So <laughs> we're just going to jump in. All right, a little bit about us. I'm Melissa Shepard. I'm a Salesforce certified technical architect. I'm a managing director at a Salesforce partner called Esther A. Uh, 35 times certified, golden hoodie, founder of a bunch of stuff, um, Mulesoft, Ladies B Architects, and Walga Architected Ambassador, Marketing Champion, User Group Leader, da da da, whole bunch of whole bunch of other things. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a thing, she probably is or has done it. Um, and also, you heard her resume during the <laughs> keynote, so you should already know Melissa a bit. I'm Lilith Van Biesen. I uh, have 31 certifications. I I'm a co-leader with Joanne for the Brussels Salesforce Architect Group and with George for Saima. Um, I'm also well architected and Ladies Be Architect Ambassador, but most of my time when I'm not behind a computer, and even when I am, I'm an amateur zookeeper of two cats and two dogs. <laughs> so that's um, where you probably find me if you see me offline or if you see me scrambling behind a computer, it's they stole something. So. We want to really dive into uh, doing some hands-on architecting, and we really want to make it as interactive as possible. But before we start creating the puzzle, let's say, let's talk a bit about the puzzle pieces. So these are kind of the bigger elements, but you've probably heard about already. So system architecture, security. Well, we, again, in the keynote saw already a lot of these quite well emphasized about what is solution architecture, why are security integrations important? Why is data important? Well, if you haven't seen the noise about AI and data cloud, then you've probably been living under some rock together with your cats. Uh, <laughs> so this is super, super important. But also, and that is something that is often overlooked, how do you get all of these great ideas into an actual uh, released implementation where people can actually use it, and that's where all this development and life cycle deployment planning comes in. And while these are very good puzzle pieces, if you're not really tying them to the customer needs and bring the communication in the right way, then you're probably just building something that nobody's gonna use because they don't know how to use it. So communication really is key. And, and that's where those softer skills come in. I know people don't like that word, but it, I don't know what else to call it. But being able to present and communicate your ideas so that they're well understood by the business. Um, and here, when you're an architect, you're creating artifacts. So you're creating diagrams. You're creating PowerPoints. That's why Lil is so good at pressing buttons over there. Um, <laughs> So these are some of the artifacts you might want to create as an architect. You, you want to show who your actors and licenses are. Um, another, a more modern way to do this is with a, like a journey map and creating personas and showing who's doing what. And that helps lay out your business process. You also have a system landscape diagram that shows your different systems, where the integration points are, what kind of security you're going to use to connect the systems. Um, that's a little bit more on the enterprise architecture side of things. And then you've got a data model, that's your typical ERD, your different objects and how they relate. Um, and w you know what's, what's going to be master, what's going to be child, things like that. Then you've got your data migration. Um, so in my CTA journey, and also Lilith, we started creating these data migration diagrams because it was just so much easier to communicate how the data was going to be migrated into Salesforce and also out of Salesforce, like for archival. Um, it just g gives the user a better vision of how this is all going to work instead of just like, trying to explain it all with words. And then environment strategy, that's another diagram that helped um, efficiently communicate how code is going to move from development all the way through the life cycle to production using a CI CD strategy. And then your governance structure, that's your different gov the different pieces of your governance body and how they all work together and relate to each other. So it is really great to create a diagram to show all that. And then your customer needs. And that could be like your journey and process mapping uh, to show your different business processes. 
Yeah, and I think we've already kind of highlighted it. So first of all, um, all of these you can visualize in different ways. There are some things that are more uh, you know, traditional, like the ERD that Melissa mentioned. But either way, whatever you do, however you visualize it, always keep the customer needs inside in, in your mind. Because if you're just bringing templates, nobody you know, knows what to do with it. Because in the end, you have to apply it to practice. So you need to know how your customer needs justify everything that you've created. And this as well is a part of our communication. The visuals are our communication. So th that's going to be your requirements. You want to be speaking to the requirements that you're given. So your diagram should underlie all the requirements that are part of your project. All right. So that was actually all the theory that we're going to do. <laughs> so it's not the end of the presentation just yet, but we're going to need your involvement for the next part because we're going to walk through a scenario of a hypothetical company, and we're going to interact with you to see, OK, which parts should we highlight here? How should we read this? How should we read between the lines to really create those artifacts together with you? Yeah, we're going to give you some business requirements and show you how to tie them into your artifacts and diagrams that you're going to want to create as an architect. So I'm not going to read this out loud, because that would just be boring. So this is a bit of the brief that we have about what is the company overview. We'll give maybe a few seconds and then start asking. Yeah, so this is your idea of what's the theme of what we're going to be going through next. OK. I'm, I hope you're quick readers. <laughs> So I don't know if there's any keywords here that already stand out that you think like, yes, this is one of the things we should really keep in mind. Anybody have anything that they see that they're like, we c should really stress this? Oh, this is Good not your out. first rodeo, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Multi-currency, yes, exactly. Anybody else? I know there's some people in the room that are familiar with this. <laughs> <laughs> it's OK. You'll get a next shot because we're going to keep hammering <laughs> and bothering you for this. So now that you've seen kind of what is the brief without highlights, these are our highlights. And indeed, Canada is definitely one of them. Very important to keep in mind for bilingual. Um, also, we see that they are selling to commercial customers. So that means that we are working with a B2B model. Um, we've already seen also the um, things that they are doing, right? So we see a bit about what their business model is, what their business is actually doing, system design, installation, monitoring. And we see some pain points as well. Yep. so these are the things you want to pay attention to when starting to think about how you're going to build out a solution for this company. So we need to really keep in mind here that currently it's really not well integrated, and there's additional work. So this is kind of why they are moving, why they are asking us as architects to even bother with them. This is what their pain point is. So this is our North Star. Everything needs to keep this in mind. We'll give a bit more time now. <laughs> as soon as you can see, they have an existing CRM system, two ERP systems, and then a custom business critical monitoring system. So these three things here should tell you a little bit more about the picture that you're going to be creating. And then over here, we've got e the users that are going to use the system. So you want to think about how are the users going to interact with what you want to build. So and when we're looking, for example, at the users, what are one of the things that you think we should really keep in mind? Anybody have a thought? Oh, Yay. yes. Licenses. So we should indeed be looking at what they're doing. This should transfer to maybe what data do they need, what kind of functionalities do they need, and that will result in our license choice. So very well done. And as you can see, there's both internal and external users, so that also clues you into a couple other things. So do you want to go over a bit? I think you already mentioned for the existing systems, but maybe for the users? Yeah, so you can see that there's 3,000 system specialists. They have a specific job function of meeting with customers um, on the designs. They supervise installations, and they um, perform scheduled maintenance. And then there's support representatives. So you can think about 
them being um, the ones that are actually going to pre well, that's interesting, pre-qualify pers prospective customers. You think that is more of like a sales function, right? But they're called support representatives. So it's kind of like a multifunction job. And they also handle post installation, installation customer issues. And there's also three service centers. So that should also tell you something as well. And then we've got the external users, which are 6,000 contractors. And they are the ones that are actually going to provide the installation services. So. Yeah, and we also see a bit of information about how they are organized, which can be helpful when, for example, we're setting up the role hierarchy, right? So here we see that the first ones, I'm way too short for this, but the first group is uh, distributed across regions. So there the regionality really plays a role, which was already highlighted before. On the other hand, for the support reps, we see that they're only located or working in three uh, service centers. So they, they are a bit organized in a different way. We don't have this information about the contractors. So it's assumptions. So this is what we have created so far. It's exactly like Melissa was saying. We have the first start of our system landscape, where you can see the current systems already. And well, <laughs> I think it's a no-brainer that Salesforce is there too. Uh, and then, of course, we have our recap of the company overview. And then here, this is our very first start of how our actors and licenses will be set up. So far, so good. Yeah, and Salesforce obviously is the center of your universe in your system landscape. So um, that's why it's a big box in the middle. Now we get into where it gets really interesting because, of course, we know what the company does. We know what the company has in terms of current systems. We know who will be working with those systems. And now we're getting into the actual process, which is also what Melissa mentioned before, that is quite interesting to keep your actors and processes in mind. Yep, and this is where you could do some process mapping to help you understand how the user is going to go through this different, these different steps. So it, it shows you what needs to happen and when, and then you can start to kind of build out your data model and integration points. That was one of my favorite things to do through my CTA journey was learning the process mapping because it just gave me a good picture of what, was, what the users were actually doing and how I could build things to support their uh, job function. Yeah, and I think if this is not something that you're used to doing, it might be a good exercise to really just start playing around with because it really helps in also understanding indeed what are they doing, but also what is the end-to-end -end because it has an effect on data, is an effect on your you know, user experience. And you might also see that there's actually some hidden integrations or some hidden interactions between different actors that you don't really see written down, but once yep. you start writing them out, Yep, it helps you find the gaps, and it just gets your mind thinking in a different way as, a, as opposed to just throwing out these technical solutions that get you thinking more about the end-to-end -end experience and then how you can support that. All right, so maybe is there something in the first bullet that is ringing a bell with somebody saying, mm, I think this or that might be something we keep to need to keep in mind? They need to upload Very good. pictures, yes. Public website, yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. So we have a form on a website for prospective customers. We know prospective customers in Salesforce lingo is? Yeah. Oh, it works. <laughs> <laughs> so lead, then web to lead makes sense. But a very good point, they need to actually upload certain things. Is that possible with web to lead So that means it, this is indeed a very good uh, consideration. So if we were going for the board and this would be the situation, we might say, say that we did consider web to lead but because of some of the requirements, or not in this case, but maybe because of some of the volumes, it was not applicable. So then you, you think about an alternative. What would an alternative solution be? Absolutely, yep. yep. She mentioned you can use a flow in a community, in an experienced cloud site, or you could have something like, in your maybe like form assembly where they're filling out a form, but that might be over, overkill. So you think about these other solutions that you could propose and what would make the most sense for the requirements you're given. 
So, and then if we get to the next uh, requirement, we see a few things. So we have the pre-qualifies, which is indeed the one that shows us that the support reps are wearing multiple hats because they're also somehow involved in the pre-sales part. <laughs> um, and they do this by filling in a custom questionnaire. So maybe anybody have an idea on how a custom questionnaire could be solutioned? Surveys, guided flow. Very, very well. What would, and you want to think what would make the most sense for an internal user logging into Salesforce? Next best action, okay. Yeah. There's, there's a few options there. Yeah. I think indeed what Melissa mentioned with who is using it, you need to keep in mind that certain tools are more geared towards external people, right? For uh, certain surveys, for example. So all very interesting. And now this is really where I, it gets a bit nitty-gritty and where you really need that journey map is, for example, the support representative schedules a site visit. How would we model a site visit in Salesforce? Lightning scheduler could be. Maps. <laughs> Any uh, other? And how to model it? If we look at the data model, what object would you keep in mind for that? Service appointment, location, events. If we go to yeah. the more basic events, but one of the things that I really like that actually scheduler is already said, so that's the air out of my way, <laughs> sales, but okay. <laughs> uh, one of the things that you really need to consider there is if you go, for example, for events, and you say yes, they're just you know maybe ha on a call, and they schedule it right then and there, how do you make sure that they actually know that the system specialist will be available at that time? And scheduler would be one of those solutions indeed, but it also comes with, <laughs> yes, additional licenses. And then you want to think about your contractors. They're going to be going on site to do these installations. They also need to access whatever object you choose. So you're thinking ahead, not just for the internal, but also the external and how it, the data is going to be accessed. Exactly. So sometimes we also need to be a bit cautious because when we see these kind of requirements, we know, okay, there's so many great Salesforce solutions that we can use here, but what is it going to be in the bigger scheme? Are they really going to leverage this product, for example, let's say um, FSL, to the fullest extent, right? Is this really going to be a full match for what they actually need or is it Yep, so I always like to say you want to be thinking about risk and ROI as well when you're choosing a solution. So you want to go with something that's going to be faster time to value, but also maybe a lower cost, even though you might have an unlimited budget. The, a better architect is going to make a decision based on lower cost, faster time to value. So I say architects are always thinking about ROI in all of their decisions and risk. We're very panicky, businessy people in that way, yes. Yep. <laughs> All right, so let's jump into some of the highlights. I, I know we didn't cover all of them, it's just time constraints. So we caught the first one well, right? So we knew it was perspective, which was lead. We knew we had to watch out for the forum on a public website, which could have been web to lead. But then we saw that we needed to upload some pictures, so that made that impossible. We took a c uh, the custom questionnaire, had some possibilities there as well. Scheduling a site visit, a lot of possibilities there as well. And then in the third one, we saw that mobile application plays a role. Yeah, and then you also see digitally signed, so that's going to tell you you need something else, uh, you know, something like DocuSign, so you can send this to the estimate to get signed by the customer. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the photos and videos need to be accessible from Salesforce, so how are you going to make those accessible? Um, and then you know, uploading files. There's a lot of things to consider here and think about how are you going to solve this and uh, m make everything available for the right people. Yeah, and then there's two more things on this that I really want to kind of see and tease you a bit. Um, the first one is the preliminary estimate. Estimate. What Salesforce data object might be yeah. But then who can access quotes? What licenses have access to yeah. that object? So, so that's indeed a, a very good one. And then somewhere on this slide, there is a new actor introduced. And we already knew, of course, that this was an actor, but now we see that they need to somehow interact with the system. Anybody spot that? Yes, yeah. the client or the customer. 
and that is because they need to add more information or upload files. So it means that somehow they need to be able to access something. It's not just a public page like we proposed earlier for the form, but now they actually need to see the estimate or whatever has been created for them and review and potentially add more information. So this means there needs to be some security because we need to authenticate that this is truly the customer who is accessing this. We cannot just put it on this public page in this case. Wouldn't that be a... <laughs> <laughs> then you got to think about the license that you're giving them. So you would probably think customer community. Well, if you're going to go with quote, does customer community access quote? No, it doesn't. How are they going to do all this? So then you've got to start thinking, maybe that's not the right way to do it, or maybe their interaction happens somewhere else. So these are all the considerations that you have to take and, and really think about. Absolutely, yes. You probably want to do some storage calculations as well. How, how much space is this all going to take up? Can you, with all the licenses you have, you do a, a storage calculation? And maybe it doesn't make sense. Maybe you're using something like Box and you're giving them a component on your Experience Cloud site and they're just uploading straight to Box. Or uh, S Drive is another one I love with Amazon S S3. Yeah, indeed. And I think these are all very important points to consider. We also mentioned data migration before as one of the artifacts. And this is also why stuff like this is important because it's about the full life cycle, right? Not everything will go and die on Salesforce. It's usually not where it ends, right? Yeah, so being able to decide what goes on platform, what goes off platform, and when all those things happen, that's part of that design that an architect is creating that you heard about in the keynote. And again, it's all parts of the puzzle because it ties back to governance. Who is going to decide what is your retention cycle, what is your archival cycle? It's, we're not trying to scare you, but there's a lot of things to consider. A lot of things to think about. <laughs> Yeah, so you can see we're building out the uh, system landscape a bit more. So you can see we've got advanced forms, we've got digital signature, we've got document generation, then we've got the public website. That's going to connect to Salesforce. We get the mobile app as well, and then the, the original three systems here. Yeah, and the customer just got added to the actors as well, so we know a bit more already. Plus, we're also building out the ERD. Yeah, so... You can start to think about like, you know, gonna have leads here and then how how do they become part of the system? You're gonna convert them, they're gonna become a contact, an account. Are you gonna create opportunities and then use quotes? Well, we talked about limitations there, so maybe it's something else. Maybe you're using orders in, and then they're using chatter to communicate with the system specialist on that order, so, something like that. You, those are things you always wanna think about and consider. Yeah, and there are some that you're already quite certain about, like the leads. I think it makes complete sense. We already know we're going to use them in this case. There are others where we're still debating, like Melissa said, if, we, if it's an, a quote that will represent our estimate or not, because it will have an impact on license, and we know that this is just a start. We haven't sold anything yet. Yeah. So we've got only a couple minutes left, so <laughs> this is... I didn't see a dance, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then we'll we'll skip the kind of yeah torturing you part, which is a shame for us, but, but fun this for is you. An, a whole <laughs> other business process. And then when you think about installation, who are the people involved in this installation process? Yeah, indeed, and which data is where? How does it need to go from one system to another? And there, it's always really important to keep in mind those hidden integrations that we mentioned before. At some point, you will hear, yes, our order needs to be there. And when you hear that, you need to think, okay, but an order doesn't live in a vacuum. So that means, does our customer need to be there? Likely in some way, yes, right? So, skipping ahead, <laughs> well, now we have a whole bunch more uh, because we know we have multiple systems to communicate to, so that leaves the ESB as a perfect solution there to do the orchestration. Uh, we also know that we have to have some authentication, SSO is required. We'll be using an identity provider to get it with Google for that. We also know that not all our data, as Melissa mentioned, is going to be stored on our system or even brought in at some point. We're doing some data virtualization. 
through Salesforce Connect, although that could be data cloud now. Yep, and as you heard at the beginning, one of their pain points was integration. So that's going to tell you you really want to use something like an ESB because that's going to orchestrate between all your different systems and do a lot of the heavy lifting. You do not want to build this kind of integration in Salesforce, or you don't, and you don't want to build point-to-point -point integrations either because that just going to that's going to create more pain points down the road. Yeah, exactly. And the question marks have been lifted, so we know a bit better because we saw the full end-to-end, -end, or at least our <laughs> didacted version. Um, so we know that it will be uh, sales cloud, sales and service cloud, then two times the uh, customer community that we are proposing there. And we made certain decisions, as you will see in the data model, about why uh, are we not using, for example, um, yes, yeah, service appointments, why are we using event instead? Those kind of things have led us to this decision. And also the, license, the licenses that you choose, they need to support the objects that the users need to access. So that's really going to drive a lot of your decision making, the, f the functionality and the object access. And we also got a better view of, as I mentioned, how your data really goes from one system to another. So we've put some of the uh, integrations, we've listed them here. We also mentioned which integration pattern will be used, which tool will be used. Of course, as Melissa, uh, Melissa already mentioned, we want to really use the ESB to its fullest extent. So, that was not that pretty. <laughs> this is a bit prettier. <laughs> and you see that something new popped up. Again, the uh, data migration and archival will be using an ETL for that. Yeah, so that's going to be, it could be part of your ESB, it could be something completely separate, it's just going to make sense. You, maybe you have something already you want to utilize or you want to go with MuleSoft or maybe, you know, Informatica, so it, whatever makes the most sense. And we did the same kind of thing for our data models. So we made a few decisions of the gray boxes that we hadn't decided yet. We've made some decisions, we've cleaned it up, and we know a lot better how everything is going to look. So I think we have time to Just take a moment uh, and recognize Gemma. Yeah. So of course, I don't need to introduce her. You've saw, seen her already this morning and already recognized everything that she's done. We both have our stories of how she has inspired us, and I'm pretty sure there's many more in the room. If you haven't read the following resources yet, I would highly, highly recommend that you go and you check them out. So the first one is actually she wrote a book about her whirlwind of a life, which I think, to be honest, how she managed to cram so much. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, and then the other part is really to check out those resources because she really, this is her, yeah. It was her vision. And uh, both of us are Ladies Be Architects ambassadors. We were asked to do this by Gemma herself and completely honored to be able to carry this forward. And um, lots of resources out there for anyone that wants to uh, go further along in their architect journey. And with that, we want to really thank you for your collaboration and for your interactivity. And hopefully learn something today that you can take back with you on your architect learning journey.